Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, uh, CEO and co-founder of RecN and host of your Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, I wanted to let you know we made some changes to the video format to move the end uh, discussion, the, top, the training and, and material topic, to the beginning of this recording so that it would be the first stop for you. And then our conversation moved to the end. If you're interested in more information, uh, racken.com slash blogs, uh, you can find the list of speakers that are coming uh, and other information about how to get involved with the uh, Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn, which we are doing Thursdays uh, in U.S. time zones uh, and then recording them. So I hope you enjoy the, the show. Please give us any feedback you want. I am Zehicle, Z-H-I-C-L-E on Twitter, if you have feedback or questions for me. Thanks. Okay. Can you all see my desktop? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, cool. And I have the ubiquitous command prompt. Uh, let me zoom in, in a little bit. And we will talk about JQ. And here's the help for JQ. I'm going to make it even bigger. I am not going to present everything from the CLI. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to assume that people know what JQ is, but we're not going to spend much time on this because I want, if, you're, if you are already a JQ user, this is the talk for you. Um, JQ is a as a JSON parser for the command line. And what it solves is I have a CLI or an output that includes bunches of JSON, like Kubernetes or our product, Digital Rebar. Um, it ejects huge amounts of JSON. And so what it does is it lets you take that JSON and then deal with it in bite-sized chunks or search it for things, um, or even just present it in a prettier format. Um, and we really haven't seen alternatives for what JQ is. Um, so it's, you know, <laughs> there's, there's people who hate JQ, there's people who love JQ, there's a lot of people who do both uh, because it's a command line tool and it has its own specific problematic syntax. Um, but it's the best thing that we've seen and we have to parse a lot of JSON. So it's super use, useful. We liked it so much that we, we actually embedded Golang JQ libraries, the JQ implementation in Golang, into our CLI so that we don't have to install JQ. We just link our CLI into JQ. Um, so if you ever, uh, like for DRP CLI, um, you go machines list. So this is bunches of JQ. If I just pipe JQ into that, what you'll get is pretty formatted JQ, which is sort of nice in itself helpful. Um, but then we actually, the DRP CLI, if you create a copy of it that ends in JQ, it turns it into a JQ parser, um, which means that you can do a dynamic link of DRP CLI, link it as, soft link it as JQ, and you'll get JQ. Um, and we did that because everything we wrote used JQ to some extent. So for example, if I JQ in here, um, this list uh, dot name, uh, I'm doing it wrong. Of course I'm blanking. Um, why? I'm freezing up under pressure. All right, uh, JQ. I do this all the time. Why am I blanking on it? Shame. Yeah. Uh, 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 I don't know what, oh, you need to do dot um, open close bra uh, bracket and then pipe to dot name because uh, Oh. It's multiple. Yeah, and you need to put ticks around it, protect it. <laughs> and this is why uh, in, it, dot, oh, in, it, in here. All of it. And and this and dot name. Dot name. Is why we need a tutorial. <laughs> so thank you for demonstrating why this is important. So this was actually carefully scripted, by the way. You would think. Isn't that amazing? Oh, we have more? Okay. Oh, thank you for pulling the people over. Welcome to the uh, thing. We have a couple more, more people joining. Um, yeah, you would, you would think, that, and this is what happens, right? We get using JQ and we, we find that it becomes super complex. Um, 
And so you can be like, ah, why would I ever do that? Um, just this thing is hugely valuable. So if I want to get the names of the machines out of uh, digital rebar, then you know normally I'd have to parse through mountains of JSON to do that. And with with this uh, system, I can just literally take it and and get the th data I need out of the system using normal JSON uh, equivalency. So I could do the same thing. So here's my names. I can come in. Um, and DRP CLI machines show uh, the name of the, that's not what I want. The name of the machine, no quotes, yay CLIs. Oh, uh, sorry, I have to say name colon. All right, so this is in, in our CLI, this is telling you to use, uh, not use the GUID, but search for the name. But it still returns a ton of JSON. So if I wanted to come in here and find the uh, UUID out of the system, I would still need JQ to pull that one field out of that, that object. Um, if I was gonna do the same similar thing out of this whole list, I could say, I just want the zero element. Um, from that list and I could do UUID like that. So, so the idea here is that there's all these times when I'm playing with a CLI, it returns a whole bunch of JSON and I need to pick and pull things out of that JSON in ways that are, that are useful. JQ is for that, um, hugely, hugely, hugely important. Um, it does a lot more <laughs> and we have some examples that maybe we'll have time for. Um, where you can actually do much bigger complex things, um, but even but just using JQ to pretty print or filter out one machine out of a list is useful. Um, and um, <laughs> one of the things that we always are going to suggest for people is if you can, don't JQ is still can be expensive. So if you're gonna if you if you're gonna return a hundred objects out of an API figure out how to filter it first. Don't just use, assume that JQ is going to keep parsing all the items out of that list. Um, this is learned from experience. You can definitely create a script where JQ is like, oh, I just needed this one element out of this you know, five item list that grows to a hundred item list that then becomes a very expensive process because you're pulling one piece of data out. So with everything used in moderation. Um, we do have, um, and I'll circulate this, uh, this document. Um, we actually use JQ so much and we get enough questions out of it. Um, people ask a whole bunch of questions. So we, have, we maintain our own examples of, um, of JQ, useful JQ components uh, from that perspective. And, um, and then, uh, sorry, I got a little background noise. And then, um, oh, and then we mix Golang templates with JQ a lot. So uh, our backend stuff, and this is pretty pretty cool and fun to do. Um, I, I have this link that shows some super advanced JQ parsing where we're actually like using JQ to build and inject and add and remove keys from, from JSON, JSON lists. And from that perspective, um, we do that in combination with like a Golang template where you actually iterate over um, JSON in a template and then do extra JQ operations in it. Um, because JQ can be really finicky about the syntax and how things go. Um, so for example, the really good example of uh, finicky JQ is when you look at the, the selectors here, um, we, uh, we were showing this example with the quotes. If I needed to, uh, I could also specify a filter. We sort of rarely do this because uh, it's confusing to get, get going. If I was to take the name and build a filter here with name, I would need to put quotes in here. Um, and then I'd have to figure out the exact syntax to make that, sorry, I think it's equals. 
Um, oh no. So there's actually the syntax here is not right. Um, Shane's probably already like pounding on the keyboard. There's a, there's a way to do filters after this and in JQ. So if I come over here, uh, manual, I'm definitely not shy about going through the JQ manual. Um, but if you're going to go in here, um, the thing to realize is it becomes pretty tricky to fi to figure out how to do um, uh, filtering. So you can definitely build in um, very complex if equals, ands, and nots. Um, even try catch. I've never my food has never gone to try catch levels. Um, but what you can do is you can build a filter um, that says you know. Here's string needs to be quoted, um, slight array slicing, things like that. Um, typically when we've been doing things, we've been using chains of pipes. The danger with chains of pipes is they have to be in quotes. And so you can get into a case where you end up with a quote slash quote to preserve it. And then you have to provide some type of name in the system and, and be aware that you're going to be building very complex nested stuff and then the pipe and this is one of the things that people uh, get frustrated about the pipe jq uses pipe to chain commands together and if you're doing it in a bash command line you will find that that pipe is overloaded and then you have to do quoting and then if you do the quoting here it messes up your quoting inside the jq lines and so we have tons of like quote here don't quote there add this, add that. Um, in a bash script, sometimes that means that we end up collecting little snippets of JQ out, out and storing them in variables or parameters um, or variables and then sort of collecting things as we go. Um, it's one of the reasons we use Golang templating to sort of limit the amount of data that we get out of JQ because that makes it easier. Um, the other thing that's, that's worth noting in this is that it really does not like uh, obviously dots and dashes. So if I was going to go in and try to do um, machines, uh, let's see, just like this, um, I should be able to pull, uh, it's not, it's not a hash. Um, hold on. Let me find a, a good example of a hash. Um, So what I'm, what I'm saying is normally I could do, where's my show? Here's my show. JQ UUID and it's going to give me back the UUID. That sounds like really cool. If I say params, it's going to give me a, a list of params here, which is, is, so we have a hash of params. So I should be able, you would think, to go in and say uh, inventory uh, slash RAM and filter on inventory RAM, but I can't because in, the slash is not allowed in this simple dot notation. Um, so if I had something else like last boot Mac adder, and I did that one instead, it still doesn't like it because of the dashes. So that means I'm gonna have to quote it. Uh, oh, and then I think I got no square braces and you have to escape the quotes backslash escape the quotes thank you press it you guys trailing there's no, no square brackets right oh i guess they're optional then uh so i might be i might i might be able to just put put it in here let me see nope so JQ this is so much fun. This is an example of why JQ makes our head explode because you get into these cases. And this is why it's so useful to be like, oh, everybody has these types of JQ heartburns. <laughs> so it's super important. You just have to be aware that if you're building up a thing where you could put any parameter in, then the idea that I'm doing, uh, you know, names, uh, uh, profiles. I see if I have any profiles set. I do. Uh, this is going to be zero. Um, 
it's not hard to use. It's pretty logical at the end of the day, but um, you have to figure out what you're going to, how, how it's going to work. Um, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. So I can then, and then I can start piping things together to make it even more interesting. Nope. Your pipe, protect your pipe. Uh, ticks around dot prams. Single tick, tick, not back tick. Yay. Um, and so it's amazingly powerful. So I can come in if I'm writing a bash script and I'm be like, oh, are there any params on this object? Then I can do length and I can say if length equals zero, then no. Um, you know, really, really important that I can check to see if it exists, has key, there's all sorts of, of filters and criteria. You just have to be able to work through what the syntax is from that perspective. Um, all right, I'm jumping back to the uh, thing. Um, we've been talking about this. There is a command line parameter. Um, we use a lot for this. So let me jump back to here. Um, uh, profiles is fine. If I if I do a JQ with a dash R, it's going to give it in. Um, I want raw it's capital R. Nope. Minus lowercase R. Yeah, no, it's it's. I thought it was would give it to me. There's another parameter what, for un, unformatted. Just R. I don't know what S is. Oh, let me try. Craig was saying SR, but. Um, I don't use it there. That's all. <laughs> I actually have. I actually have in the code that I write. I end up with um, pretty standard JQ dot something something else. Um, oh, this is scary. Uh, hold on a second. I'll get to scary. So understand that you might need command line parameters to strip out the um, pretty pretty print stuff. There's a command line that lets you do a single single put it all on a single line and take out the, the carriage returns and stuff like that. Um, we talked about multiple steps of pipelines. We talked about length um, and then just reducing JSON output. So that dot params re literally reduced me from a two level object, nested object to a single. Um, talked about filtering a little bit, I'm trying to be careful in my time. I'll show you what editing JSON, the JSON looks like in, my, in this example. Um, before I dive into the super deep, is there a quick question? Um, all right, I'm going to, this batch, batch of code that I provided the link for, um, takes the, the data that I was, takes this data, which is super deep. Um, uh, let's see, no params. Params. It's just go high, I think, right? Mm hmm Go high dash inventory. Thank you. That's why you need the quotes. Single, single tick. And I don't need the ticks actually in this case. Whew. So this is a huge amount of JSON. Just like deep garbagey, not garbagey, but it's definitely deep, deep JSON. And so for us, we needed to um, take that JSON and then collapse it into regular strings. And that's what this, that's what all this code does one way or another. Um, and the way it does it is it literally runs JQ against that sub object. Um, so you build it, you, you provide a JQ thing and it spits out a string and then that string gets stored back into the system. Um, and what, what that ended up looking like is building a, a variable called inventory in which we take an empty inventory object and then we use this plus equals to add in a JSON sub object. So a key colon value um, item. And so that's basically this idea that I could add or remove items from a JQ list. Um, super powerful function of all the code we write with JQ. Um, we talked to the team yesterday about it and, you know, we, there's times when you definitely need it like this, but for the most part, use with caution because it can be very fragile. 
um, a lot of JQ stuff can be fragile. So when you're coding against it, what we're talking about now, be proactive in quoting things, in doing checks to make sure things exist. Um, you could see how easy it was for JQ to throw an error because I had a parameter wrong. Um, and so, you know, it's powerful, but it, it takes some, some futzing. Um, and then the other thing in bash scripts that I run into all the time that's worth noting is uh, a lot of times if I have a JSON file, then I'm cat, you know, the file pipe JQ. If I'm working in a bash script um, and I'm using variables, then I'm going to be using the pipe in of the parameter. So this is the syntax that you're going to be using if you're manipulating a whole bunch of JSON data stored in variables. Okay, Whew. and that, I'm five minutes over. I, I hope this was helpful. Um, definitely a ton of material dumped in J, about JQ in very small time. And I'll open it up for questions if people have them. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of where I'm going to drop this. Oh, we have I have some chats and I was missing it. Ah, Jason had to go. Cool, Lucifer, Rami, do you have uh, comments or questions? I if there aren't more questions, um, you know. We'll go I, ahead. And, I would just comment. Yeah, please. I would just echo the comment that um, it is extremely fragile and you have to futz with it an awful lot. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's useful because JSON is um, it needs manipulation a lot of the times to be useful. And so when you start to play with JQ, just know that you're going to need to sit down and be very, very patient. If you try and smash through JQ problems in a hurry, you're probably just going to frustrate yourself. Yeah, it's definitely the right tool for the job, but Shane's right. You're you're going to have some bloody fingers and bruises after your first couple experiences with it. I still have. I mean, it's Shane. How many times have you been working through a batch of code and been like, JQ is just the cause of whatever weird behavior? Every single time? Every single time, yeah. I know. There's times when, and, and we have we have one guy on the team who loves Python, he just writes a Python script to parse the JSON because it's, it's, which is a reasonable, if you, have, if you have Python available, it might be, that might be a simple way to parse something. Use Ruby or uh, Python. It's, it gets the job done. Cool. Uh, I will post the um, a link to this document and uh, I'll move it into a shared location and then allow people to to see it as part of the part of the results and then I'm going to collect um, I'll post this on YouTube and I'll send out a, a, a place for it um, and I'll I'll post it back to the DevOps uh, different different places so check it out um, and there'll be links from the rack and blog about um, the lunch and learn. So thank you for coming. I appreciate your time and I, I hope this was helpful. Please give me feedback so we know um, so we know what, what to do and uh, how to improve and what guests you want to hear more from. There he is. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Okay. And so far no attendees. So we are recording just as a reference. So hello everybody and welcome to the first uh, Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Roar, roaring crowds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know I need Yay. to get a... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I do have a hard stop at uh, 15 of Shane, so I'll 
if we're still going, I'll turn it over to you at that point. Um, and, and our lineup of guests has actually been growing. So um, I might not be the draw or there just might not be enough time or there might be a problem with the registration system. Any or all of these things. Um, let me see. Uh, I can actually post a, I'm gonna post this to Twitter and see, ah, so I'm gonna see if we can um, get more people. Uh, I don't see where I can do invites off of this meeting. Probably a good thing to learn. So Shane, oh, here we go. We have we have a guest. I'm promoting everybody to panelists. Uh, so Jason, welcome. I'm gonna have to figure out my, my lunch plans and schedules to uh, coincide. Yeah, I was getting that sorted out also. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> Good, how are you? Welcome. Not too bad. Uh, it's just, it's it's Shane, Shane and I are both from Rack End, so, uh, and the, there is, we are recording, just as a heads up. So. Okay, I'll keep it clean. Um, but, but welcome uh, to the to the inaugural uh, distance DevOps lunch. Thanks. Yeah. The, we will talk, and I'll, I'm going to wait a couple minutes, and then I'll start talking about JQ, and uh, we'll have some fun. I was going to say that we've got some. Uh, I've had a whole bunch of people come in and ask to be speakers. A couple of nudges I gave, um, but we'll have Terraform from Eric Wright. Um, some. Uh, dealing with management in a disaster um, with Josh Atwell, which will be cool. I got Dave McCrory to come in and talk about uh, data gravity in a couple of weeks. Oh, nice. Um, I think the, the Pulumi team is going to do a thing on Pulumi. Um, should be fun. I think it's going to be hard to limit people to 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this, this is a, it's an interesting area, and there's a lot of growth, and there's a lot of tools out there. So I was hoping to use this as kind of a thing to kind of, kind of catch up. I used to do a lot of uh, sysop work back in the day, and I moved on to like pre-sales and other things. So I'm trying to refresh my toolkit. Cool. What do you do pre-sales for? Uh, I work for a small company that builds uh, video delivery networks. Interesting. Video yeah, delivery. so... Oh, we compete with folks like Akamai and uh, ah. yeah, it's, it's, I can't say a whole lot, but, um, but yeah, we're, if you've actually seen video across a major cable company in the U S it's probably actually touched one of our pieces of software. Awesome. Okay, cool. So edge, you're doing edge type stuff. Yeah. It's, it's basically video content delivery networks. So we do okay. over the top video for uh, all kinds of folks. Nice. Oh, oh but specifically video. It is is optimized for video. Okay, cool. We've done. Um, I, I host a podcast called The Latest Shiny. Nice. Um, and we we do a lot of edge um, discussions. It's one of our our focus areas. Oh, really? And, and there are, if you went back through our catalog, so we've done 150 episodes. Um, if you go back through our catalog, we've interviewed a couple of edge. Um, there was a gaming focused uh, uh, CDN. We've interviewed a couple of different CDN companies. Um, and so if you want to ping me uh, out, out of band, I'm happy to, to have y'all come in and talk, talk um, what y'all do on. Sure. On I, I may ping our marketing guy and see if that's something he wants to jump on. I, I tend to do cool. more of the customer engagements. Yeah, no, of course. Of course. That's fine. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, but you'll be interested, interested knowledge on, on some of that and we, what we've been talking through. Actually, I can think of it. I need to get some more of the CDN people on. Um, we have a nice backlog of guests, so we end up with, there's plenty of, <laughs> plenty of topics. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, there's a lot of churn in the field. I mean, there's a lot of competition. I mean, we, yeah. we tend to be more sort of, you know, hidden in a lot of organizations just because of where we deploy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's worked out well. We're, we're doing pretty well. It's that's good. It's entertaining. Super important um, right now. Especially yeah, these day and ages. Yeah, getting slammed from that perspective. So I'm sorry. What was the name of the podcast again? 
latest shiny and latest it's spelled, shiny. Oh, there it is. spelled it's lead speak so it's spelled ah. i-s-t okay fair enough i'll see if i can find that thank you you're welcome always happy to promote the <laughs> podcast it's a labor of love we're not sponsored so uh it's just um just Stephen and i having having fun having great conversations which is what a podcast should be but and then well, uh, it, it looked like there was a fair bit of interest on this on the the devopsish telegram channel i, I guess i'm surprised <laughs> that there's not more people have joined uh i you know you'll it's my experience with any of these synchronous events is that um, everybody's excited about synchronous events and then actually showing up for synchronous events, not as easy. So well, I everybody's time challenged. I'm sure be, yeah. there'll be recording, you know, there'll be recordings and if you're like me, you'll watch it at one and a half or two times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just, I thought I was fortunate that this did actually line up with my lunch break that I typically block during the day. So I'd, I thought I'd sit in and at least listen. Awesome. Um, and I think as we get some momentum and start doing a regular, the reason why I took the first slot is because my expectation was it would, it would build slowly. Mm -hmm. Um, as we get a, a library of just like spinning up a new podcast, um, of course that way. And then on, on Thursdays, I actually do a, I have some colleagues and we're doing a speakeasy format. Um, I say speakeasy format like everybody should know what it is, but we just made it up. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask, but I figured you'd get there. <laughs> I think of it like an open mic. So the idea is uh, we line up four speakers ahead of time, and they, they each get three minutes to give a pitch or a talk or something like that. And then um, there's a, a two minutes for Q&A, and that, that's a 30-minute meeting right there. And then we sort of have some open, the, the idea is we don't want this, um, it's, a, it's an evening thing, so it's like a more happy hour-ish, mm -hmm. but we don't want this wild west, you know, because you get this, this thing going on where somebody says, I'm, you know, I'm the master of AI because I've read about it and blockchain too. And then you get into an argument about whether AI and blockchain are something. <laughs> um, so they're sort of like micro pitches. So yeah, so what we're doing is we're saying, you get the mic, you can make a micro pitch. <laughs> and, and then when you're done, we're gonna pass it to somebody else, but we're not gonna have a, we're not opening it up for wild debate. Um, which I think is cool, but I actually sometimes like the wild debate. So that's the uh, idea for the format here. Sure. Uh, on that. Um, and JQ's uh, super important. I, I'm, I was planning to get our CTO to do a full pitch at uh, Lisa which is a the Linux, uh, large-scale Linux administration. Yeah, I used to go to those a lot back in the day. It's, uh, it's the only conference I've been to where people literally do their presentations from a command line prompt. I love it. It's the best. I miss going to those. <laughs> it's been a few years. Yeah. Uh, we, li we like it too. And then SRECon, I don't, they, were, they rescheduled from, uh, what, March to June. I think they're optimistic with June. At this point, I mean, so is OSCon still on this year? Uh, which? That's the one that's usually in Portland, open source convention, the O'Reilly one? Uh, OSCon. Yeah, sorry, yes. I call it OSCon. Um, Everybody says they, a different, sure. They, I think they just made the decision to switch to virtual. Okay. Is my understanding. Yeah, yeah see, I'm, 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 I'm in Colorado, so OSCon to me says like, oh, it's like a Wizard of Oz kind of thing, you know. Uh, I, you know, I think the fa the, the uh, O'Reilly group um, has decided, oh, actually, no, even worse. Um, right, Oz, no, yeah, OSCon was an O'Reilly conference, and they made a decision to stop doing all conferences. Period, or just for this year? Period. They have their, I guess they, I missed they, that announcement. They, uh, let me find the link. Oh that. my goodness. That's, that's astonishing. Uh, 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 O'Reilly. Yeah. O'Reilly. Um, yeah, did they announce that? You know, I'm actually looking at the OzCon, uh, I'll follow your format. Yeah, the OzCon, uh, notice, but I don't see a date <laughs> on it. Cause that was another one that was just a blast to go yeah. to. No. So here's transforming our in-person events to online. We've made the difficult decision to cancel all future O'Reilly in-person conferences, including OzCon. Wow. Um, well, this is one of those things they're saying that this event's changing our society and how people will, you know, do their daily business. And then this is a reflection of that. Yeah. Well, uh, they, they made this decision really fast. So I, I think the cost value of 
these conferences is declining. Um, and then dramatically, they're really becoming like all single vendor sponsored shows. So there's they're competing, and so I would I also participate with um, Interop, which is another type of like it's another media publication doing a, a vendor neutral show. Mm -hmm. um, and it's awesome, but it's, they're having trouble pulling in the users. So, because you're competing with like Splunk Fest and. <laughs> well, there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of, it's, I mean, it's a great time to be in this. I mean, I remember back in the day where, you know, there were only a handful of channels to do this kind of work and now it's just stunning the diversity. Right. Well, and, and then, and then if you're like, I, the one I think of all the time is Hashi, HashiConf. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, they have a, pretty nice show that you know showcases around their stuff and people come in and talk about it. and then if you're in, in the orbit then you come in you know you come in and do it but you end up with crazy numbers of shows yeah my organization has actually been joking about having sort of a, a micro show um you know where we kind of invite some of our folks uh, big customers to sort of a, an off-site and then we kind of walk through the different processes and workflows that people have developed and mm -hmm. you know it's it's more of like a birds of a feather conference um but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that. And it, it's, it's sad to see some of the fragmentation, but it's, again, it's astonishing to see the diversity of the tool sets that are out there and, you know, how fast they're developing. Yeah. No, that's exactly, it's, it's crazy like that. Well, that's why I'm, I'm relying on, on these types of events to kind of, you know, stay in sync and at least catch up and make sure that I, I sound like I know what I'm talking about when I talk to my customers. That's a good, I think a good strategy. Um, it's yeah, tough. That's why, that's, I mean, well, it's, it's, it's fun for me. I get I get to use the excuse of inviting uh, my friends and and people I want to learn from to uh, come out and, and do a talk. So let's see. All right. And so from that perspective, I, if you want, I, we're about at the right time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna roll forward in the in the topic. Okay. Fair enough. Thank uh, you. Let's see. No worries. Um, but I'll do it. Let's do it interactively, and uh, I'm gonna present to a recorded audience, uh, or assume from a recorded audience perspective, but. Um, Feel free to jump in with questions or comments or things like that. And Shane, I know you you're going to have opinions, so um, don't don't be shy. Let's see. Ah, oh, here's desktop three. And 